G'day folks, this is Shane. I thought I'd do a bit of an end of year wrap up and just go over some of the best and the worst of 2018 of the stuff that I've had a chance to try this particular year up until December. So this video will go live pretty much right at the end of the year of 2018. So firstly, I hope and wish everyone a very safe and happy new year. Hope you have happy holidays, all that kind of stuff. Wherever you are, Merry Christmas. If you don't celebrate that, happy Hanukkah and whatever else there is out there. Just uh, enjoy yourself, be nice to everybody. And uh, yeah, I hope you all have a rockin' new year. So I I'm gonna break this down into a few different sections. We're gonna go over some guitars, some pedals, some amps, and then accessories, and then also go over some of the worst stuff of the year, at least in my opinion. And this will only reflect my experience with the stuff. This, obviously everyone's got their own opinion when it comes to what they like and dislike. And just keep that in mind, this is just my opinion on the stuff that I've tried. So I thought what we do, we probably start with the amplifiers because there's been a couple that I tested earlier on in the year that I actually purchased. Well, one in particular, and the one that I'm gonna go over firstly is the Marshall DSL 40. I've been talking about it to death. I love that amplifier. It just, it's a pedalless amp, which is great if you're into just plugging in, turning the gain up and you're ready to rock. It's got a great clean channel too. And I just love that amp. And that was one I tested from Sky Music and I ended up buying it because I, I loved it so much. So. The Marshall DSL 40 would probably be the amp of the year for me, at least in my opinion. In terms of the sort of the higher end stuff, and I say higher end stuff, it's not a high end amp, it's not a boutique amp or anything like that. But just out of the stuff I've had a chance to try, it's one of the more expensive amps. So yeah, the DSL 40CR, awesome. These aren't really in order either. These are just in terms of what I liked. So the next one would be the Boss Katana Artist. I was blown away when I plugged straight into this amp and it was the first kind of boss katana that it, really I didn't want to hook it up to the computer to get any sounds out of it. It just sounded good already and I think that's one of the artist's strength in terms of the boss amps is the fact that you can just plug in. You can do that to some extent with the older series, but I really feel like to get the most out of those you really need to plug them into the computer. The artist just sounded good. I remember when Rick, Dr. Rick from the channel plugged into it for the first time. He played it for ages and he was stunned it was a solid state amplifier or a modeling amp you know it, it, it really sounds good so uh yeah boss katana artist is a great amp and they would easily cut it live as well no doubt about it and they're fairly light too which is also really good now this next one was something that i got to check out while i was at GeekCon. i'd also tested out a couple of these amps prior and I've got them up on this speaker up here, but you can't see that right now. So these are the Joyo Bant Amp Amplifiers. I tested two last year. I tested the Fender and the Vox style one, but the ones we're gonna talk about today are the Joyo and Jackman Amps. The Joyo Zombie and Jackman Amp, I should say. So the Joyo Zombie is a, is a Mesa Boogie or Mesa Boogie, however you wanna say it. And the uh, Jackman is based on a Marshall. Both of these amps kill. They're really, really good. I've kept them, I'm gonna keep them. I've got a 212 box I'm gonna gig with, with one of those amps coming up as well. So stay tuned for that. There'll be a video posted about those. I just think they sound great. They've got really nice clean channels. They're 20 watts. The drive channels are great. So even if you don't have any overdrives or distortions, you're gonna get a great tone. I like them both. I don't know which one I like more. I'm gonna reshoot some videos of them here at the house with this 212 box. When we were overseas shooting the videos, it was a couple of gremlins maybe in the sound. It wasn't quite what like what we were hearing in the room, unfortunately. So I'm gonna shoot a couple more videos on those coming up. They'll be up in January, most likely, uh, as I'm probably almost filled all of my slots for the days up until the end of the year. But yeah, those Joyo amps are great. And even if you own, say, the Fender style one, the Blue Jay or whatever the Vox one's called, they're all good. I kind of wish I had to kept them now. They were, they were great, but you gotta sell what you gotta sell sometimes to make ends meet. All right, so in terms of what else, we got to test out a Fender Blues Deluxe Western Noir, or N-O-I-R for those who are wondering how that's spelled. This is a limited edition Fender Del uh, Blues Deluxe amp. It's got a really unique Tolex, it's got a different speaker, it's got a Celestion in there, and the thing just sounds amazing. The clean channel on it is awesome, you know? And it's one of those things, I always speak about how much of an upgrade a better speaker is in an amp. Minus the Tolex, the only major difference between the Western Noir and the stock Blues Deluxe would be the speaker. The rest of it's the same, right? So, and it's not even close. I, I would put how that amp sounds up against my Blues Deluxe, which I love, with the Eminence Swamp Thing speaker. So 
yeah, the Western Noir Blues Deluxe definitely gets the thumbs up from me. I, I think it was just, it's just a killer. This next amplifier is great if you're a home player and you just want something small and quiet that won't annoy the neighbors or any of that kind of stuff. The Mua Hornet Digital Modeling Amp is great. It has all these different kinds of sounds that are built in from uh, clean all the way through to like metal. So it's got, you know, bluesy tones and rock and roll and all that kind of stuff. And you can get all different kinds of gain stages from Fender to Marshall to Boogie and, line, you know, Line 6 style kind of heavy crunch tones. It does everything like that. It's really small. It also has Bluetooth connectivity if that's important to you as well. You can play your music through it as well. But it just sounds great and it's a really good small practice amplifier. It has delay and reverb built in. Also, I think I think it's got like chorus and a few other effects as well. But I use it anytime I just do like a Facebook live stream or something like that and I'm jamming to some backing tracks. It's a really great tone. And so many people ask me, oh, what amp are you using? And I'm like, it's this. <laughs> and it's nice and small. And it actually must be in the other room right now. But uh, it's a really cool little amp. Is it down there? No, it's not down there. But it's a great little amplifier, and you know, if you're just looking for something you can jam with in a lounge room or, and not annoy anybody, it's a really great amp for that. It's not loud by any stretch of the imagination. I think it also has like headphone jacks, sockets, and all that sort of stuff, so you can play headphones plugged into it, which is also cool. But overall, it's a great sounding amp. You can sort of save your favorite sound in there as well, which makes it easy. You can turn it on and just have that sound the next time you use it. So I think that's pretty cool. You can either have it in live or preset mode. Moo are making a lot of cool stuff. Uh, and this little practice amp pretty much blew me away. I, I don't know if I, I'm actually... You know what? Since I've got it, I actually got to be honest. I haven't used the Bigera much at all. I kind of like the fact I can plug into the Moo Hornet and have delay and a few other... Like reverb, a nice reverb, dial in some different tones... I'm not going to say it's a better amp than the Bigera V5, just it's very different. But for for just using something at home that you don't want to wake the neighbors or anything like that or annoy them, it's definitely a really cool little amp just for jamming at home when you don't want to be loud. And lastly, in terms of amplifiers that really impressed me, was the Kemper Profiling Amplifier. Totally stunned how much I love this thing. I've got it right over here out of shot. I use it all the time. It's just the best recording tool. If you've got amps you love and you want to recreate that sound for recordings or whatever, it's the best tool in the world that I'm aware of for doing that exact thing. I've been yet to find anything else that does it as good. Does it work great with pedals in a live situation? If you're going through, say, uh, you know, I know there's powered. I, I have actually got the passive Kemper profiling amp. There is a powered one as well, and I've heard people use that live and with, with external effects, and it's not always great, but the passive one... You can use it with pedals straight into the desk. Say if you're going into your computer without a PA, uh, without a speaker, an external speaker. But if you're using it with an external speaker and you've got the powered Kemper, I don't think the pedals kind of respond the same way as they would straight into like an analog amp, but they still sound okay. It just requires a bit more tweaking, but that's just sort of like it's one limitation. But if you're using it just straight as a recording tool, it's unreal. So Kemper profiling amp, along with the Marshall are probably the two favorite things of the year for me in terms of amps. Up next, we're gonna have a quick chat about some of the guitars that impressed me and some of the ones that I had no expectations for that totally blew my mind. Now I am left-handed. I did have a couple of right-handed guitars come through as well uh, that Rick got to play, but I'm just gonna go off the experience of what I've had a chance to actually physically play. So in terms of the ones that blew me away the most, the first one, without a question, would be the Mendiola from Pure Salem Guitars. This was a left-handed, beautiful-looking, sparkle red, candy apple red, whatever you want to call it. I think it's a sparkle red guitar, loaded with a mini humbucker in the bridge and a Telecaster neck pickup. Great combination, great tones. These, are, these guys are out of Florida or Miami, Florida. Um, the guitars are made, I think, in the same factory as Reverend Guitars. So if you're familiar with those guitars, they're just beautiful. They're really great instruments they feel great in the hand they look cool i would say it's a nicer guitar overall visually than my prsse which i absolutely love that thing so you know in terms of the guitars one of the guitars that blew me away that just blew me away it felt like i'd been playing it for years as soon as i picked it up so it gets the big thumbs up and it also gets the thumbs up because it looks different and unique and it's a lefty so that's always awesome as well all right up next we've got one of the Another random guitar, which is actually kind of behind me right now, but I'll overlay some B-roll so I don't smash it into anything. 
This is the little crow Kestrel. This came through a couple of weeks back as of shooting this video. It's loaded with two TV Jones Filtertron pickups. It's awesome. Made in Australia as well. It's great to see an Australian company doing good things. A lot of the hype of uh, you know the guitar industry is from the US and that's justified also. A lot of great stuff coming out of Europe as well. But you know I think it's great to see an Australian company who kind of get it. And they're doing something different, something that looks awesome and something that sounds killer. Now, if you haven't seen any of these videos, I'll, I might leave some links in the description below. But um, yeah, this little crow guitar is awesome. I've got to give it back, unfortunately. It's right behind me here. And uh, what can I tell you? It is just a killer. I love TV Jones pickups. I've never had a chance to use them until playing that guitar. It's got a big fat neck on it. It just feels good to play. So that's definitely on my best of 2018 list in terms of guitars. Now, if we're talking about some less expensive stuff, actually, we'll go. We'll get to that in a second. We'll, we'll stick with some of the, the more expensive stuff that blew me away. The Fender 50s Original Series Strat. Wow. Maybe the best Strat I've ever played, including all the custom shop ones, all the American standards, all the Mexican made ones, everything. That guitar is still get haunting me in my dreams, man. It, uh, it's one of those things that sounds so good and it plays great. It's got a big fat neck on it. Now, the only downside about it is it had sort of like vintage frets, which if you know my channel, I'm not a huge fan of, but it's still in the shop. <laughs> it's giving me nightmares. So uh, yeah, the 50 star, even the Telecaster that they make in that series is fantastic. I got a 52 reissue back here one of these guitars back here somewhere and it's a great guitar but I reckon the original series guitars are better and it's just my experience in how they play how they sound how they look all that kind of stuff they're stunning stunning instruments so uh, if you haven't had a chance to play one you're looking for a custom shop check out the original series I reckon they're way better value and sound just as great one of the other guitars that really blew me away coming in at a lower price point was the Squire Contemporary Series Telecaster not only does it look cool, the humbuckers sound great. They've got lots of bite in the top end. And that's one thing that sometimes humbuckers, especially from Fender, don't have is a lot of top end. They tend to sound a little bit muddy, especially once you start playing up the neck and you're playing a lot of the higher notes, it can lose its definition. Those pickups sounded great. The guitar played really well. The switch and everything felt good in the hand. And I would put these on par, I guess, with the classic vibe guitars in terms of how they feel in the hand. They also make a couple of other guitars like a strap with a couple of humbuckers and all that kind of thing. But the um, the Squire Contemporary Series Telecaster was definitely uh, just something that really blew me away. I thought it was a really nice guitar. Two guitars which I purchased and one, I first saw these when I did a guitar search Saturday here. And I was like, an SX Telecaster? Aren't these junk? So I picked one up in the shop and I played it. I went back the next day and I bought it. And I was like, do, you, do they make left-handed strats? And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, we've got one. So I don't even want to look at it. Just, just, I'll buy it. <laughs> That's one of the few times I've ever done that. But I was so blown away by the Telecaster and around, around $200, right? Australian money. So I don't know, under 200 if you can buy them overseas, I guess. But they come in at around that price and man, oh man, they sound so good. They sound, they play great. They're finished extremely well. Everything about them is just great in the hand. And I, I can't stress that enough for a cheap or slash inexpensive, people like to use that word, I don't care. Cheap guitar, it is a cheap guitar, feels great in the hand, plays great, doesn't need any work, the pickups are good, all that kind of stuff as well. So both the Strat and the Tally from SX get the thumbs up from me and I actually don't even want to mod the Stratocaster, which I, I planned on doing. So I just love the way it sounds. So I might have to dig up a, another one at some point and do this pickup mod that I want to try. But they're great guitars. And lastly, in terms of the those kind of guitars, the Harley Benton TE52, great guitar. It's got some minor flaws in the finish, uh, just on the neck, but otherwise just a spectacular guitar. I've had a chance to play it live, much like the SX as well. So I put them kind of on par. It's just which one do you like the best? And by the time this video is up, I'll have the shootout done and I don't have the results for that yet. I think it goes live tomorrow night. But it's one of those things where you know, if you're wondering, should you get a Harley Benton TE52 or a VTG Series SX guitar, then I would probably say whichever one's easier for you to get. They're both great, so food for thought. Over to some of my favorite pedals of the year now, and some people will agree with this list and some won't, but it's all subjective, like everything in this particular kind of niche or, you know, interest. So 
One of the pedals that I loved, and it's very, very simple to use, is the Greenchild Mr. Boost. This thing's awesome. Anytime I use the Marshall, my only pedal on the floor, other than if I use a wah pedal, is the Mr. Boost. It's great. I did a live session with the boys recently. We posted that video on YouTube, and that was the only pedal I had. And it's great because what I love about it is it just gives you more. And that's it. If you already love your sound, you just want it a little bit louder or a little bit more saturation if you're using it into a dirty tone with a little bit of a volume kick as well. It's a great pedal. It doesn't do any weird things like some boost pedals I've had come through do. And what I mean is uh, the sign of a, of a kind of crappy boost pedal is if it adds way more top end than what you've actually got. I've, I've experienced that. The only other really great boost pedal that I, uh, that I can recall off the top of my head is the Maxon one that they make. It's like a dual button one. They've got a vintage mode on there, which is awesome. The Mr. Boost is by far my favorite boost pedal as of right now. I dig it. It's just a volume boost. 27 dBs. It's built like a tank. It's awesome. Now, one of the maybe the most divisive pedals of the year was the Exchanger pedal, which was basically like a pickup kind of loading system. If, say, you're playing a Strat, you can make it sound like a humbucker or you could take a humbucker guitar and make it sound like a Strat. I love this thing. I think it's great. It's sitting right here. It's one of the best, most unique things I've had come through the door, and I love it. And I said to the the guys that make this, uh, his name slipped my mind right now, that it's such, a, Ambrose, I think it is, such a great sounding pedal, uh, and it's unique, and I'm definitely gonna put this in the best of the year for me. I, I was just totally blown away by it. It's something that I plan on taking to the next live session we, we use. If I'm playing a Strat, for example, or, or a Tally, I want to try this in a live situation and see how it sounds. But for what it does at home, some people were saying they couldn't hear much of a difference between certain settings, and that, that might be somewhat uh, fair. It just depends on what you're listening on as well. But I could hear a huge difference, especially on the ones I started with. And the reason I didn't do a lot of clean tone tests with that video is there's plenty of them already online. I wanted to do something a little bit different with that video. But the exchanger pedal is an absolute monster. I really, really like it. It's no huge secret, I'm a fan of VS Audio. They make my favorite overdrive of all time, the dual overdrive, the Royal Flush. I just think it sounds great. They also make a single channel one with a toggle switch, so you get both channels that way, uh, and you can't sort of stack them, but you get the, the ability to use both of the two channels independently, basically, in a single pedal. And this thing rocks. I mean, if you like the Royal Flush, you're gonna like the Straight Flush. I guess the benefit of the Straight Flush is it takes up less space. And if that's important, it's a really great pedal. I reckon the Greeks are building some of the best pedals in the world. Over the last two years, the stuff that's really blown me away the most is the stuff coming out of Greece. Not just them, but other companies as well. Um, but yeah, the VS Audio Straight Flush, uh, it's great. I've used it live, it sounds awesome. Without question, another pedal that I have to add to this list as an overdrive is the Shelly Pony Boy. This is a Klon influenced pedal. It has a two band EQ, influenced. I guess it's a Klon pedal basically, but it has a bass and a triple control. It also comes in at around a hundred US dollars, give or take, and it's made in the US. So this might be the most affordable Klon out there, and it just works. I've used it live, it's killer. If you're looking for a Klon, or if you, you don't like the Klon sound and you're looking for something that does something very similar, it's a great option because you can add in the low end, which is something the Klon doesn't have. I've owned the Klon, right? and it's a very upper mids heavy sort of thing. It doesn't have a lot of low end. You can make the Pony Boy sound fat and full sounding and, and great on its own, which is something that a lot of people don't like about the Klon. I remember when I first got the Klon, I turned it on, I was like, sounds terrible until I worked out how to use it properly. The Pony Boy will give you a much better result and it's super cheap. You won't have to go spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on a pedal. So it's, it's really, really cool. Now in terms of a modulation pedal that really stood out for me, the Dan Electro Big Spender. This is kind of emulating uh, a Leslie-ish kind of sound. It's a spinning uh, speaker simulation pedal, basically. And one of the great things about this, not only is it inexpensive in terms of the, the grand scheme of pedals out there, it's not 20 bucks, but it's not you know, $200 either, is the fact that it's also got a ramp control on there as well. So the ramp control allows you to speed up that speed spinning speaker effect or to slow it back down awesome i haven't had any other pedals come through uh I, I maybe ever i'm gonna go out on a limb and say maybe ever that can do that i think it's just a great modulation effect 
If you're going to be playing behind another guitarist, for example, and doing blues, it'd just be a really great effect to have in the background just to mix up the sound. It's, it's a really killer pedal. I can highly recommend it. One of the uh, inexpensive pedals that really caught my ear or eye is the Kalen Ghost Rain Delay. This thing is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I actually sold it to one of my subs, uh, Jamal. I hope you're enjoying it, mate. But this this pedal is killer. If you're looking for a delay that's inexpensive, get the Ghost Rain. I think it's called an Echo Delay. Don't get that confused with uh, Reverb. It's just a straight up delay pedal, and it's amazing. So uh, go check it out. It's a it's a really nice pedal, and they don't cost much either. That's the cool thing about Kalen is it's not that expensive. And lastly, something I want to add into the list. This could kind of, this could have come under accessories to some extent, but it is a pedal. So I'm going to put it in with this, the Mua G200. This is an amp simulation pedal with multi effects. You can import IRs, all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of in a way like a mini Kemper in, in some ways, you know, you can add your own IR, speaker IRs in there, for example. So if you don't know what that means. You can set up say like a, an amplifier sim and actually buy like a Celestian IR for your favorite speaker or whatever, import it, and then you'll get that sound. It's got mic simulation and everything. So you can use it straight up as a effects pedal going into your amplifier like normal, or you can use it as a recording device straight into your computer, or you can use it into the PA system live, which is how I've used it live as well. It's a really great pedal. And John, I hope you're enjoying that as well. It's, it's an absolute monster of a pedal. It does everything. It'd be a great amp backup situation say you're at a gig your amp fails pull this out plug it into the pa system it's going to sound epic and i've i've tested that out as well it's really really good so that kind of wraps up the pedals um there were lots of like great ones that caught my ear but this list would definitely not be complete without adding a fuzz pedal which absolutely blew my mind i'm not a fan of fuzz pedals usually i i don't have much of a use for them in terms of what i play when i go out and play live but I can appreciate when they sound great. And this one's the best fuzz pedal I've had come in. The best. You know, I tried a Big Muff and I actually enjoyed that. This was years ago. Uh, I've tried a few that I like, but I think this one would probably be the best. This is the Dazzatronics Big Fuzz Pedal. Man, oh man, I had so much fun shooting that video. If you haven't seen it, I'll post a link somewhere up here. You can check it out. Just unreal. It's made in Australia. It just, it's this big, full, fat sound of tone and it sustains like nothing else. There's not a lot of clean in there, right? So if you're looking for a Big Muff style pedal that does more, the Desertronics Big Fuzz is just off the charts good. Um, I've just never really found a use for them in the, in the live context, but this one, this one's mighty. I, I, I love it and it's one that I've kept and I'm gonna keep it because it does something that's just, you click it on, you smile. <laughs> it's awesome. So yeah, Desertronics, you hit a home run with this one, mate. I, I, what can I tell you? It's a, it's a really great fuzz pedal if you're into higher gain fuzz tones that are smooth and they got lots of mids, so they'll cut through the mix. Check out the big fuzz, man. I, I call this the best fuzz I've ever used, and that was the title of the video, and and no clickbait was in the title because it's it's awesome and I really like it. Up next, we're gonna cover some of the accessories which I either purchased or was sent to do reviews for. And this first one was one that I actually purchased called the Pile Microphone. It's an SM57 copy, it cost me 14 bucks. It was awesome and you know, a lot of guys said they ordered three or four and they were ecstatic about it. Go check the comments, I'll leave links up here as well. I'll also post some links in the description so you can check these things out. The Pile Mic for 14 bucks is a monster. If you like your 57s, you can't really go wrong with these things. They, they sound so close. Uh, and I've got 57s, I've done tests between them. There's not a lot of difference in them. Great for recording your amplifier. You can use them live for singing too or whatever, but snare drum, guitar amplifier, all that kind of thing. Anything with a high sound pressure level, they're gonna handle it no problems at all. So the uh, Pile microphone is pretty much close to the top of the list for 14 bucks, man. Awesome, I should get some more of those at some point. I think I can finally add another speaker to my favorite speakers of all time, the Eminence Tonka. I put it in my Marshall. It does exactly what I was hoping it would do. It's kind of like a cross between the Swamp Thing and the Texas Heat, except it suits the Marshall, in my opinion, really well. This is all subjective stuff. Some people said it sounded too much like a Fender. I didn't hear that at all. And if you saw our live clip, it still sounds like a Marshall. It just, it has all the right kind of frequencies for that amp. 
It's almost a safe speaker. They said it was kind of similar to a Texas Heat, but had a bit more bite, and it was maybe a better tally type of speaker in terms of its top end. And I gotta tell you, I love it. So the Eminence Tonka, it's I think it's like 150 watts or thereabouts, and it's really efficient, so you get a lot of headroom, not a lot of speaker distortion, which is what I like. So the, the distortion you hear is coming out of your amp. So you're not kind of like capping the amplifier volume with speaker distortion. It kind of sometimes can reduce your overall volume. So in my opinion, the Tonka rocks, if you've got an English speaker like a Marshall or any of those kind of brands, it would be a really good choice for that amplifier. And maybe even for a Vox as well. There's an AC30 C1 or S1 or whatever it's called that's come out. I could almost envision a Tonka going in that amp as well. I think it's a it's a really great upgrade. Up next was something a little bit different. We got I got a couple of things sent from X Vive, which were the XLR wireless uh, microphone kit. So essentially, you could have like a, a mic in your hand, for example, or if you were singing, you could you know use a microphone with a wireless pack on one side straight to the desk on the other side and no cables are required and it sounds great it, it could handle like guitar amplifiers loud and all that kind of stuff so the x5 wireless kit in terms of the handheld mic kit were good now the wireless pack that i got sent as well which was for electric guitar was good but the mic pack was better i just did it's better built i'm not saying the other one's bad either so don't don't take it the wrong way i've kept both but the uh that actual XLR pack, if you're looking for something that you can, you know, if you want to sing wirelessly and you got a Beta 58 or an SM58 or any of those kind of microphones, it will just do the job and you don't have cables running around everywhere, which is also really cool. Another thing which I did on a part of the series called Music Gear on a Budget was the Behringer sound card. This thing blew me away, man. And people have been saying for years, if you go, if you go to buy a Behringer product in a shop, Salespeople always give you this, the same spiel. They say, oh, you know, the Behringer preamps are really noisy. They're fine. In 2018, you're not going to find those problems. At least I haven't found those problems. The sound cards that I use are the UR22s from Steinberg. I couldn't hear any difference using the Behringer, not in a good or bad way. It was just fine. And I, I've got three other um, sound cards that I had a chance to test. The Behringer would be up there. In terms of value for money, it can't be beat especially if you're just looking for a single channel sound card. I'll leave links below, you can check them out as well. So if you wanna start recording, you know, you, you know, if you wanna record acoustic with a microphone or record electric guitar with a mic, or start singing into your computer, any of that kind of stuff, this would be a really great thing. It's also good for stuff like this. If you wanna do a podcast and you wanna talk and you're gonna have a, you're gonna have great sound quality. A loud car just went by, hopefully that didn't come up. But uh, yeah, you're gonna have just a really great device that's gonna work. It works for Mac and it also works for PC as well. Um, yeah, it's a little bit more fiddly to get going on the PC, but it still works fine. And what can I tell you for the, I think they're around 30 bucks. Like how can you go wrong? <laughs> it's pretty awesome. And lastly, on this list of accessories, something that I borrowed off a friend of mine, Dave. So thank you so much, the cigarette amplifier pack. So this was an amp that they built into a, a Camel cigarette pack. And it, it is one of the funniest things. I only This video only just went up online. So if you're new to the channel, you haven't seen it, check it out. Just type in, uh, just go to my channel and scroll back a few videos. You'll see it. That's probably the easiest way. But it's a an amplifier. I think it'd be around two watts or something like that. You can power it off a nine volt battery. It's literally this big. Uh, it's the size of a cigarette pack and it's got a built-in speaker which is hilariously bad but it can also power the quad a quad box or a 212 box or whatever i got a 212 marshall down here that worked with that fine so that would definitely be uh, on the list of just one of the most unique accessories i guess it's an amplifier in a way but I, i'm going to throw that in under accessories because i don't think it's taking itself too seriously and uh what can i tell you it's great up next, we have the best of the worst. So essentially, this is like, I guess the worst of the worst is a better way of putting it. But anyway, this is the stuff that kind of sucks and I justify my reasons behind it. So the first thing, without a doubt, the worst thing that I had a chance to try all year. And, and it's only the worst because of its, I guess, poor design is the Fret Zealot. Now, this is a learning tool that you stick on your fretboard. The first one broke as I was applying it. The second one ended up as a, just a complete mess. 
as I was trying to take it off the guitar that I wanted to sell. So uh, once you stick these on, if they don't break putting them on, they work fine and you'll have a great time learning new scales and all that kind of stuff. The LEDs kind of light up and show you the patterns. The app's pretty, pretty cool as well, but they break. They break as soon as you want to take them off, you'll break it and it'll be thrown in the bin. Two sets of these, all of it's in the bin now, just junk. I gotta say though, their packaging looked amazing. I just think they could, you could, how could they make this better is I guess what I'm trying to say. They should just make a neck you can bolt onto a Telecaster that has all the lights built in. This sticky stuff just doesn't work. The edges didn't stick properly, but the fretboard ones are stuck way too well. And once the glue hardens, it's game over. Taking them off, you're basically throwing the whole system out. Now for 200 US dollars, it's way too expensive. Uh, if it was 50 bucks, or if they could send you a free one, if, if it tore or something like that, or if you had to get it off and put it on another guitar, even five bucks for the uh, an extra strip of LEDs, that would be cool, but I don't think that's an option. I, I don't know if it is, but it's, just a hor it's a horrible design. It really is, and um, I was pretty brutally honest in the video review I did of it, saying, you know, the first one broke, this is the B-roll of that. <laughs> And this is what I like about it, and here's how it can improve. So the fret zealot, terrible. I, I, I know a lot of guys do use it, and it works well for you. Um, just know that this is my experience only. This isn't to say that the product is complete garbage, because it works. You know, if you get it and it works, and it helps you learn, that's a positive, right? But what I'm getting at is, you know, for a guy like me who had to take it on and off, it, it's basically it becomes useless. So just, just keep in the context of what I'm saying here. All right, up next, the XTR strap locks. I bought uh, about four packs of these, pretty cheap, about 12, 13 bucks, or well, maybe $15 Australian, somewhere around there. I thought, oh, these are great. So I, I redid all of my guitars, except for one or two at the, that particular time. So these strap locks are basically like Jim Dunlop copies. I put a video up about uh, that as well coming up, or it may actually be up by the time this video is up. Just warning people just to stay away from this brand. I had a couple of them break. I had three of them break actually, but two especially were almost impossible to get off. I had to use a grinder to get uh, the end off one of them. It kind of scratched my guitar a little bit. I was spewing. These break without warning. One broke just, I think I took it out of the, bag and it was the other part of it was on the floor and this is the part that attaches to the strap the the end just falls off so the part that you would normally pull open to like release the strap lock that's not something you can reattach and once that falls off you, you can't get it off basically right so it sucks it totally sucks so um after three of these particular points broke on three of them i took them all off i've got a big bag of them i'm gonna throw out i don't know what else to do with them like i don't know if i should try to just try reselling the ones i haven't used or what but i've got about 12 packs of these things and uh yeah you know that that's enough of an odds only you know it's three out of 12 but it's actually less than that it's like it's three out of i guess 24 you can look at it that way but that's still enough because you know you get two for each guitar. So three out of 24 is still too many breaking within a short amount of time. I don't trust using them again. So XTR strap locks, you also see these rebranded. I'll hopefully put some stuff on screen so you can you know, know what to look for. But um, yeah, what can I tell you? I'm pretty disappointed with those. I should have stuck to the shellers. The shellers haven't let me down uh, over the years. So I may go back to them or even the Dunlop ones actually pretty good too. But I don't expect everything to be perfect, but to have strap locks break without any real force or, I wasn't even like pulling on the end. I don't trust them at all. It, it just something that broke. All right, up next, this might uh, offend a few people, but I'm gonna give you some justification of why. The Marshall Origin 5 amplifier. Worst sounding amplifier I've ever played. It's horrible. It is so bad. Everything about it just sounded terrible. Um, yeah, what can I tell you? I put it up against my Bugera V5 Infinium. The V5 <laughs> wiped the floor with it. Now I did an AB shootout with this on my channel as well, so you can find that. Just type in Bugera versus Marshall or something like that, you'll see it come up. So for me, this was the worst sounding amp of the year. Um, it was it was horrible. I, I Nothing about it sounded good. Now if you're a home user, you might get some use out of it, 
but I would buy the Bigera every day of the week over buying one of those Marshalls. It, it, it is so lackluster. I kind of feel like the entire Origin series was a huge letdown. I remember when I bought my Marshall DSL, everyone's telling me, oh, wait for the Origin. It's going to be amazing. That was the internet hype. And then everybody heard them. They went, Ugh. look, some of them aren't too bad. You can get some good tones out of the 20 and the 50. The head's probably the way to go. You can pair that with a better box. I just think the speakers in the amps let, are a huge let, let down, at least in my opinion. So uh, the Marshall Origin 5, by far the worst sounding amp I've ever played. <laughs> Stay away from it. The 1 watt Marshall DSL sounded way better. And like I said, my Bugera, which is uh, on the floor over here, completely wiped the floor with it. So uh, food for thought there. If you're thinking about buying one, go play it before you buy it. I didn't like it at all. There's one other amplifier that really just made us shake her head, and this was the Fender Bass Breaker amp that Rick actually blew up during the video. <laughs> so just to put this into context, while I'm adding this to the list, I'm also going to preface this by saying I love their 15. The 15 Bass Breaker sounds great. It's got reverb, it's got three different gain stages. It sounds awesome. So I love that amp, right? So I'm not against the way that they sound. I'm against the reliability of these big, of these larger ones. I went into a few different shops and they all had faulty valves, right? So I could hear this really chimey sort of sound. It sounded like broken glass in the back of the amp. One of these particular bass breakers, that was another shop I went to as well, had one of the speakers detach from the actual cab and it was floating around in the bottom of the amplifier. The quality control on those amps are terrible. Uh, and I don't know if it's just all of them or it's some of them or whatever, but Man, the bass breaker that blew up was just one of those things. Dr. Rick, man, he fired it up. It sounded good. We we're rocking out and then stopped working. Now, this kind of stuff can happen. Amps can just fail. Valves are easy to fix. All that kind of stuff. But I've seen way too many problems with these bass breaker amplifiers. So with the exception of the 15, which I really like, and I haven't really experienced the same problems with that particular amp, the rest of the series, man, nothing but rattles. Except for the little head. I think the little, the small head that they make is also pretty cool. But those 212 ones, man, be very cautious if you buy one. If you've had problems with them or not, let me know in the comments as well. This is just my personal experience with them. But uh, yeah, the Fender Bass Breaker. R.I.P. Thanks for watching, guys. My name's Shane. I thought I'd put together this list of the best and the worst of 2018. I hope you enjoyed this. I'll also put this up on my podcast. That's in the bluespodcast.com or you can find it on iTunes as well. But I thought this would make a really cool video to sort of wrap up the year. Let me also thank everybody for all the support over the year as well. As you can see back here, we now have the uh, silver play button. So thank you so much. The channel reached, or we're up to 104,000 subscribers as of shooting this video. And the other cool thing is we're almost at 60 million views. I think by the end of January, we'll be up at around 60 million views, which is insane. So thank you everybody for the support. I really appreciate it. Thanks to all the Patreon subscribers as well. I also appreciate everything you do to help the channel as well. And anything that comes through on Patreon goes back into the channel to make things better. Now, speaking about that, what, have, what do I use this stuff for? So th this month on Patreon, I've actually upgraded my my internet connection at home. I have a secondary line now dedicated for YouTube stuff. So this means better live streaming, much better quality. I can stream in this kind of quality now, maybe not 4K, but I'll be able to stream in 1080p 60 with a DSLR and it should look pretty much as good as what you're looking at right now. So this internet connection is awesome. And it's a wireless one, right? So I need to probably iron out some bugs but this mobile sort of home broadband thing that they've got sorted out now in Australia is 10 times faster in the upload speed than what I've what, what I've been used to as well. So you're gonna see some really high quality live streaming coming up. It means I can upload a video instead of it taking five hours, it'll take about 30 minutes, which is so much better. So yeah, thank you to all the Patreon subs as well. Let me know what you think of this list. And if you have some additions or if I missed something, it's possible I missed something. I put a big list together for this video. If I missed something that you either really liked or you didn't like at all, let me know. So we can maybe make some honorable mentions in the comments. I'll pin the most relevant post. Thanks again for watching. My name's Shane. Don't forget to subscribe and also click the bell. And I'll catch you soon. See ya.